Well, hello, my friend. I'm Timothy Fleming Sr., the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for tuning in today. Words from a senior pastor. And from the table to the heart. These are table talks, but more than that, these are healing words today. We're trying to mend some broken heart. We're trying to heal some sin-sick soul. We're trying to lift a bow down head. And these talks are going into people's home that you would be surprised to know about because people are people. And some people don't go to church, but they're listening for a word. And we're going to bring the word right in your home, to your computer, to your iPhone, wherever you are. You can continue to hear the word. And these are table talks now, not just sermon, but table talks. I may be talking about most anything, whatever it's going to take to bring you back together, pull you out the basement and bring you up on the upper level. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a storm? Have you ever been in a situation where you were caught and had no way out? That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about what will you do when your ship busts up and goes down? What will you do when your ship bursts up and goes down? Oh, I tell you, my friend, I could talk quite a bit about this because we need to accept the fact that life is full of storms. I want to tell you something that really impressed me today. I, I went years ago and saw this movie about the Titanic. I was very impressed with this movie. It was very heartbreaking and moving when you look at it. And at the end of it, my heart was just broken. I was so in sorrow about what happened to those people that went down. Well, the story goes on to say, the Titanic was unsinkable. And people believed that, people were told that, and hundreds got on that ship, felt secure. They went on sailing. They kept right on sailing, having fun, drinking, dancing, laughing. The very rich down to the very poor was on that ship. But word came to Captain Smith, there was icebergs in that area where he was sailing, but he didn't pay any attention and take heed to the warning. And while people were just still dancing and their, their ship had hit an iceberg, well, people didn't believe that ship was going down. They kept right on dancing. And many more of them would have been saved if they'd gotten on the lifeboats. And, but they didn't because they didn't believe it was going down. And within the next few minutes, the unsinkable ship went down to the bottom of the ocean. Oh, only a few hundred survived. But I guess maybe 1,000, 1,500, I forgot right now, went down in that ship because there were over 2,000 people on that ship. But the unsinkable ship went down and hundreds went down singing, Near, O my God, to thee. Have you ever experienced that in your life where things were going fine? You felt secure? You had a lovely family? You had good health, you had a good job, you had a little money in the bank, you left, everything was going just beautiful, and many of you felt like your ship could never go down. You had a marriage that was so awesome, you felt it could never burst apart. You had a job that you felt secure, and you had been there for years waiting on your retirement. You never thought that job would go out of business or foreclose and you would be without work. You had children that you really raised and you loved them. You never thought they would turn against you. You had friends that you had, had confidence in and you told them your secrets. You never thought they would deceive you and put your business out all over town. Oh, my friend. Your health was good. You were living well. You had the blood of youth dancing in your vein, even as young people. You never thought you would get cancer. And all of a sudden, it looked like your ship burst apart 
and went down. Let me say this to you. That's life. That's life. There's some things storms teach us that fair weather will not teach us. Fair weather sometimes can be tricky. When everything's sunny and everything looks good, we think that's life. No, life is about winter and summer and spring. Nothing stays the same. So what do you have to do when things change? You have to prepare for it, right? You can't go around wearing summer clothes during the winter. I hope you have put your winter clothes up, those heavy clothes, those wool, the things that you really wear in this, when it's cold. You put those things up waiting for the winter of next time. But then you prepare for summer clothes. So you don't walk around when it's 100 degrees wearing a coat because it's summer. What did you do? You prepared yourself. You knew it was coming and there's nothing you could do. You can't do nothing about the weather. Storms come and there's nothing you can do about it. Things go wrong and there's nothing you can do about it. But you can prepare yourself to deal with it. When a storm comes to our city or comes in Atlanta, you sometimes, it's too late to run and hide. So what do you do? They tell you, take cover. But some people are prepared. They already have a fallout shelter, a basement. They are already prepared. They buy food, they buy batteries, they buy things that they might need in case of a storm coming. So look, you can't run. Sometimes if you run at a hurricane or tornado, you'd be worse off. They'll tell you, stay put and take cover. Be prepared for things when things go wrong. I hope that has blessed you already. So have yourself and your mind conditioned that you are ready to take anything that goes wrong. Shall I repeat this? Be prepared and have your mind set for things to go wrong. What destroys most people, they get caught off guard. They don't think it's going to happen. You know, a lot of people don't like to talk about a funeral home. They don't like to talk about getting their, uh, their graves or their, their caskets prepared. They don't want no life insurance. They don't like to talk about that. But oh, it's coming. One day you're going to die. You're going to need that little plot cemetery. You're going to need that vault. You need to go on and be prepared for that. That's why you have life insurance, so that when things come, you won't be as stressed out. I pray God, that's what school is about. You young people really need to go to school. I know you're doing well and you got a job making a little money, but you could be making much more. There are jobs out there, I'm told, that pay a lot of money, but people are not trained for them. It's all about being prepared for the things that's gonna come your way. Well, I wanna spend too much time on that. Let's get into the, the message today. That was another Titanic. Maybe not the word that it could never sink, but it was another Titanic. It went down right here in the Bible. In the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, a ship went down. The Bible teaches us that Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, he was a persecutor of the church. He murdered the people of God. He hated church people because he was so in traditionalism and he was so into the Jewish uh, uh, Hebraic, history, Hebraic history of the Jews and he was more structured and, and educated around the Hebrew canonization, the law, the writings, and the prophets. But he also was a devoted devoted religious man to Judaism. And he hated the name of Jesus because he felt he was a revolutionist. This man was uh, not good for the country and they didn't feel Jesus was good for the temple and the Jewish worship. Though Jesus was a Jew, he hated it. Well, one day he went around persecuting the people of God. I mean, he was just there. He was there when they stoned Stephen, the first uh, a deacon of the church was persecuted, the first martyr in the church. He was there. He 
He enjoyed watching them stones steal. In fact, he took up arms to kill the Christians and he persecuted women, children, old men, and all of them. He didn't care anything. If you were a Christian, Paul hated you. One day he was going to murder some Christians on the road to Damascus. I'm rushing through this as fast as I can now. And he met Jesus. Jesus knocked him off his horse on the road to Damascus and blinded him. And when he became a Christian, he became converted. That's Acts chapter 9. He became converted. And once he woke up to saw who Jesus was, he became one of the greatest proponents of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was the greatest evangelical missionary preacher to ever walk upon the earth of the Lord. And listen, friend, this one thing I say about Paul, what he believed in, he believed in, and he gave it all he had. So when he was a persecutor, he was the best. But when he became a defender of the gospel, he gave it the best. That's probably why God picked him, because God knew that whatever Paul put his hands on and believed in, he was log like dogmatic, you know? He was dogmatic, that's that word in, in uh, theology, in systematic theology, but, but you talk about dogmatic mean he put his teeth in it and just like that, oh, like a dog, he held on to it. You couldn't sway him to change his mind. He was dogmatic in what he believed. Now, Paul gets so serious about the church, the people who in Jerusalem who were uh, still holding on to Judaism, and some became Christian, didn't like Paul mixing with the Gentile, but he was chosen to go to the Gentile world, I believe. And that's, well, that's what God told him. I'm gonna take you to Rome and you're gonna witness to the world. When he did that, the Jews in Jerusalem got upset and they were about to kill Paul. But then the Roman soldiers intervened at the, at the uh, command of the governor and they got Paul and got him off from among the people before they killed him. That was God protecting Paul then from his own people. Have you ever thought about some people that plot to do something to you and doesn't succeed? Have you ever thought about it was God that protected you and you didn't see it? You felt like you just escaped on your own? No, it was a hand more powerful than what you know. God is shielding you from your enemy. God know when it's time for you to go. And if it's not time for you to go anywhere, God will shield you, you hear me? He will protect you from those who are out to plot and get you. And sometimes the way God shield you, <laughs> he may let you get in something bigger and worse to get you out of something that really like to got you out, took, <laughs> taking you out of here. I hope you understand. Sometimes God will put trouble on you and, and to get you out of trouble. So he ends up, Paul, in jail, but that prison and that, those soldiers putting him in prison really got him up around his enemy. God used trouble to get you out of trouble. you think about that later. Now Paul is in prison, but now he goes before the governors and they question him and, and they really, festivals about to take him back to try him in Jerusalem. But Paul said, no, I plead my case to Caesar because Paul was a Roman citizen as well as a Jew. That's what I was telling you about being prepared. Be a Christian, but also be trained, be learned, because God can use you more when you get around intelligentsia or when you get around grandma. You, you, all things are all people, amen? Young preachers, look, remember that. Take this from me. Be prepared for both. Blessed is he that is flexible, for he shall not be broken. Take that from an old pastor. You ought to be able to be flexible wherever God can use you. If you got to preach in the country, know how to preach country. You got to go to the city, know how to preach city. You have to go around uh, other races of people and you have to have an interpreter. You got to know how to speak to them. I've done all that, preached around the world in many different countries. And there were times I had to change my style. You got to be able to preach the gospel to everybody because all cult culture is not the same. Paul had it all. And that's why God could use Paul more than he could Peter. Think about that. Paul was ready for everything. Now he's going before Caesar. He gets on the ship. And to make the story short, he gets on a couple of ships and they 
transport them to another Alexandrian ship, and they start sailing. They began to stop in a small town, but then Paul started telling the people, and you read this for yourself, Acts chapter 27, he's going to tell you all this. He tells the people, uh, look, let's not, let's stay here and not go any further, but he was outnumbered and voted to go on to, Alexa uh, to another place, Phoenicia, to go to Phoenicia on this Alexandrian ship, which was a ship that carried wheat to the Romans that came all the way from Egypt. He told them, don't sail any further, but a lot of people didn't want to stay. They wanted to go to Phoenician, a more, say, upper class place before they would go to Rome. They didn't like going to Fairhaven and all those little places. Those little towns were like little country towns. So Paul said, let's not go any further. Let's stop here. Now we're going to get into application of the message in a minute. They didn't listen to him. He was outvoted. They said, let's sail because of a cool, soft wind. And when they did, they got caught in a storm. And the storm drove that ship from place to place. And it finally burst up and hit the sandbank. And then the waves started hitting up against the ship and broke it in two. And the men had to swim to shore, and God protected them. But now let's get to what happened. What happened to this ship? Why did that ship go down? Why do people's ship go down? I'm trying to rush, rush through this. You got to read this on your own, but I'm just going to get to the high points here, the application. Now let's go back. A lot of ships go down in storm because we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. The Bible says here in Acts that Paul told the, the soldiers and the captains who was, and the men who was in charge, which was Julius, the centurion, and he was in charge of all of them. And he was head of, he was over the seal of this ship. This Julian, he was over sealed, and he, he was something like an old warrior, his old seaman. He'd been working for the Romans for many, many years, but he's in charge. Uh, they wouldn't listen to Paul. Paul told them, look, let's not sail because this is bad time to sail. Paul had already been in three shipwrecks, so he knew as an old seaman, he, he knew the weather and it wasn't good to sail. But what happened? They decided, no, we're not gonna stay here in this little old country town. We're gonna go and go to Phoenicia, a better city, then we'll port there and stay till the storm and the winter season over there and go on to Rome. Paul told them, don't do it. But they outnumbered him and said, we don't want to hear that old preacher. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And they ignored Paul. So what's the first point? They wouldn't listen. A lot of people, ships, have gone down and many of your ships have burst apart and some of your ships are going down because you won't listen. It's bad when you won't listen. And when I say won't listen, doesn't mean you have to do what people say, but a lot of times some people just won't listen to you. And you know what? Destruction comes to you when you don't listen. You really want to tap your home as a wife just have that attitude that when your husband talking to you and you won't listen, there's nothing that will destroy your relationship when a person is bullheaded, stubborn, and won't even listen to you. You can, anybody can listen, even if you don't agree. Listen. Look, I've been married to one woman 48 years. Hey. I know about marriage, and I know when we were young, when I was younger, more bullheaded, and she was too. But the worst thing that happened in our marriage when we were young is that we didn't want to listen. And as we grew older, we began to settle down more, Sister Fleming and I, and start paying more attention to each other when we want to talk. You want to destroy your marriage and destroy everything you got is to have that attitude that I don't want to hear you. And you know what happens when a person trying to talk to you and you over talking them? Oh boy, 
let me tell you some women, that really turns a man off. You want to drive your husband in the street, drive him away from your home into something he doesn't need to be in, is when you won't listen to him. You got to listen to him. Let him talk. Men can't stand nagging. They really hate it more than anything when, when you're trying to talk and you over talking them and just won't listen. I'm just trying to tell you what to really tap your home. You may not, now women, when they go at each other, that's just a, that's a, that's a battle. Men can't get involved. When men get in it, he, he means nothing. <laughs> they overlook us. When they go at each other, you might as well just hush men and go on out of the way. For well, that, they don't ever stop. But a man, he gets aggressive when somebody like that. So you get your husband's attention when you listen to him and don't say nothing. Even though sometimes you might not agree, let him talk, let him talk. And then you have to, as a man, listen to her. When she's talking, let her talk. We both can't argue and get nowhere. You got to stop and respect each other. And I find out in counseling, I just don't say nothing. And all I have to do is tell the other person, look, be quiet and let them talk. Let them get it out. We know in psychology, the greatest thing you can do if you're gonna be a counselor is have a listening ear. Don't preachers talk about your situation when you're counseling people. They don't wanna hear about all that. I know you wanna make them feel like you know what's going on. No, 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 no. You, you're getting involved now. Just listen. That's what a psychiatrist does. He, you're gonna pay him well for him just to listen. <laughs> Praise God, and a lot of money. Hey, listen, and listen to good counsel. And then you gotta be careful who you get counsel from. Amen. I think the story is told one time about a man had a mule, and the mule just wouldn't plow. And he got tired of the mule, and he went to his friend and said, you know what, my mule just stubborn and won't plow. I give him water, I feed him, and when I get on the field, he'll just stand there. And uh, what shall I do? The other gentleman said, well, I'll tell you what you do. If he won't do what you tell him, go get some more water and pour some kerosene in it and let him drink it. And that will settle it. Well, he jumps up and go get water and put kerosene in the water and give it to his mule. Next day, the mule died. He ran to his friend and said, hey man, I asked you for some advice about what to do with my mule when he won't move. And you told me to put kerosene in that water, my mule drank that mule and he died. What happened to yours? He said, simple, he died. <laughs> so 20 years, hey, you gotta be careful who you listen to and who you take advice to. Make sure that you go to the right people that will listen to you and you will listen to them. They wouldn't listen, how would they wouldn't listen? Paul was advising them not to sail in that weather and they overruled him. That's the next point. Don't always go with the majority. They got in this storm and that ship went down because they, were out, they outnumbered Paul and they went along with the crowd. Just because Paul was one man and the other was saying, no, we're going anyhow because of, we see a soft, smooth wind and we are going anyhow. So Paul was outnumbered. Just because the majority vote doesn't mean the majority is right. Sometimes, friends, you have to be careful with crowds. Crowds follow crowds, and most folk in the crowd don't know what's, what, what's going on. They just follow him because it's a crowd. Just because you have a big church doesn't mean you have a great church. There are a lot of big churches, but not great churches. A great church is a church that keeps the mission going. And it may be a small church. I don't know why some people call that church greater, but some of them, we started that years ago, and I told somebody there's no such thing as greater church. They're all great churches, small one and the little one. No church is greater than the other because it has 
memberships. My God, that's a one thing to count numbers, but it's another thing to make numbers count. What are you doing with that great church you're supposed to have? It's a great church when it serves and witness and spread the gospel. Not coming up in there, sitting up there looking all fans because you have a round uh, intelligentsia and and uh, the liturgical way of worship, and you have all your high up friends who have money, educate. That's not church, that's a social club. Listen, friend, you're not coming to church to look at each other and be around the grandstand and be all, all into yourself. No, you need to be into God, not people. Crowds will fool you. Crowds will holler Hosanna today and crucify you tomorrow. You know what the majority did when Moses sent out the spies? The two spies said we can do it, but the majority said we're not able. And they did conquer because the two spies said we can. But the other 10 tribes said they're giants. We like grasshoppers in their sight, Moses. We can't conquer that city. That was because the majority ruled, but that doesn't mean they are right. Don't get caught up because everybody into something. Don't be doing things because everybody doing it. It may not fit you. Don't wear things because everybody wearing it. It may not fit you. Don't say things that everybody's saying because it may not work for you. What may work for some people may not work for the other. Am I talking to somebody? Watch the majority report. Now, let's go on to the next point. When they overrule Paul, and they decide to sell anyhow, they sell because of a soft, smooth wind. That soft, south wind, read the text, a soft, south wind, soft, south wind. It was smooth and soft, cool breeze. Then they said, see, we can sell. This, this is a soft wind. Don't let the soft wind fool you the next point. You'll sink your ship. Following the soft wind, you'll sink your ship because you're moving because things look good. Fair weather has fooled a lot of people. Fair weather friends who smile in your face and want your place have fooled a lot of friends. You got to watch it when things are going well and everybody's bragging and everybody loves you. You're going to find out sooner or later that soft wind doesn't mean you can sail. Amen. So many times some of us join churches because it looks so perfect. And you'll jump from place to place. And you'll say, oh, this confusion in this church where I am. And I just don't like it. I, I'm going somewhere else where they don't care on like this. And you get fooled. Yeah, that's a soft wind. People fool you in that church too, talking about yours. But they have the same thing going on in there. You just don't see it until you get in. And you find out, oh God, it's a mess over here. I should stay where I was. Oh, see, you got fooled by soft wind. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. The devil talked to Eve softly, soft wind. But once they got evicted and kicked out, where was he then? Nowhere around but laughing. That's the way people are. They come with a soft wind, charm you out of your money, charm you out of your confidence, charm you out of, your, out of everything you have. And when things, when they've gotten out of you what they want and the storm come and things start going wrong, you can't find them. If you got a good friend, still keep your eyes open. You never know, what did I tell you, when friends fall out, Anything can happen. Things go wrong. It may start off good, but don't be fooled by soft winds. Trouble came upon them. They got caught in that storm. Now let's look at something else when they got caught in the storm. They wouldn't listen. And of course, I want to tell you, they were in a hurry. 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 They didn't want to wait till the storm season was over. They didn't want to stay in a little small place of Fairhaven. They felt it was too country and, you know, like you're in, the, you're in a country place, not many hotels. There wasn't a lot of fancy women and fancy hotels and all the fun that they wanted. 
and they were in a hurry. They were in a hurry to get to Rome and didn't want to wait. When you're in a hurry, you can really mess up things. Let me tell you something. Take your time. It's better to wait till it's the right time to make a move than to be in a hurry and lose it all. You young people, take your time. Don't go marry somebody you just met. You don't know them. Why? You'll never know what you're getting until the storm comes. Why that's so important? Storm brings out what's in people. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. When things go wrong, you find out what's in people. I always recommend courtship to take a good while. Dating, getting to know each other. Don't rush. Don't be talking about love at first sight because love at second sight going to tell you about what you just got in. Don't be getting all caught up in a honeymoon because after a while you'll be in a honeymoon and then you have a moon and no honey because you were in a hurry. <laughs> Am I speaking to somebody? In a hurry because you met somebody and they sound good and they look good and they smell good and there you go. I want to marry. I want You don't know nothing. You got to wait till some storms come and see how stable they are. If people will be with you when you're down, you don't have to worry about them when you're up. But you got to hit stormy weather to find out. And your ship got to get burst apart before you find out. Don't be in a hurry. And don't be in a hurry to get grown. You'll get there. Just keep on living. I saw a young man one time walking with a cane trying to be cool. So you don't have to worry about that. Keep on living. You'll be walking and leaning on it for real. <laughs> Amen. Little girl putting on her mama makeup and a wig, you know, when she's child trying to dress like mama. Trying to look grown up. Don't worry about it. You'll be there soon. Take your time. Listen, if you don't learn how to have patience, you will become a patient. Stop being in a hurry for things. Slow down. A young fella came to me all upset about his grade and he was crying and upset because he didn't pass the grade. And I said, listen, young man, you have all your life to learn. You'll get it right. Take the course again, take the test again, slow down, don't hurt yourself, just slow down. And we're in a hurry. Uh, something else I want to tell you today, as I hurry along, what caused the ship to go down, they was, well, let's tell you the story. They wouldn't listen to the man of God. When they wouldn't listen to Paul, they had to listen to him later. Oh, listen, the Bible teaches us in Acts 27, when they got in a storm, Paul told them, I told you all not to do this. Now you're caught and you're out here 14 days, haven't seen the sun, and now they're beginning to panic. Oh my God, they're caught. No way to get out. And Paul said, I told you all not to sail, but you overlooked me, you ignored me, because you wouldn't listen to me. You know, a lot of you all ships going down, and I'm not trying to tell you to listen to me or nobody else, a preacher, but a lot of you all going down because you won't listen to the man of God. And I'm sure somebody said, well, who is he? They said that to Moses, didn't they? Who are you to tell us what God said? Well, why can't God tell us? You, you know, you're not God, but we are God's spokesman. And God could talk to you and tell you, but he didn't do that. He picked a man to talk to you because that's God's man. Now, I know there's some strange voices out there but the Bible said, try the Spirit to see if it is of God. If he's in that Bible, you're safe. But he's going off out there and all this other stuff to some of them out there talking about what God said, not what God said. Whatever they tell you, just make sure you got the Bible to support it. You can say, I receive it, but you don't have to go do it. 
I receive it and then wait and see if it comes. Don't go selling your house and everything you got because some prophecy and do that. No, wait and see if it comes to pass. Because some people are telling you stuff God said. Lady came to me one time and told me what God told her to tell me. I said, well, he better tell me. Because other than that, he hasn't told me. But when he tell me, then I'll know. And God will talk to his man. Because people have you doing everything with you, said God said. You got to stand on the word of God. But he is God's spokesman. They didn't want to hear Moses. And they finally, Moses said, you all don't want to hear my God. Yes, we do want to hear God. We don't want to hear you, Moses. And then God said, tell them to go wash up and come around the mountain. When they came around the mountain, the children of Israel, and God starts speaking, lightning started to flash, and the thunder started to roar, and the mountain started to shaking. And man, all that, that, that looked like that whole mountain was just moving. And you can imagine that fire coming out. They told Moses, tell God to hush. <laughs> Be quiet, tell him to hush, we'll listen to you from now on. Moses was God's man. God's not really talking to folk like he used to a long time ago. And then he spoke through prophets. He, the word prophet means knobby, spokesman for God. He, he's speaking through uh, the apostles, now he's speaking through bishops and preachers, whatever you call them, as long as they're in the man of God. You better listen to the man of God. A lot of you all, the Bible, the man of God tells you to pay your tithe and you won't do it. The man of God tells you to come to church, you won't come. The man of God tells you to study the word and you won't. You read everything else but that. You won't come to nothing at the church. The man of God, you won't listen. Then you want to know why your ship went down. You won't come to church, you won't study the Bible, won't support nothing. And then you want to know why your ship went down. You're not under the covering. You're not, you don't have Jesus on that ship you got. So your ship going down and you can't call on him to say peace be still. Because he's not on board. On the ship of Zion, he's there. So listen, friend, when you don't listen to the man of God who's preaching the word of God, your ship is going to bust up and go down. Right, but it's right. Now look, even though people get in storm, as I said before, a storm is not to show really who you are, but a storm is to show what's in you. Now let's go on a little further in this text here. The Bible says they had to throw overboard the cargo to lighten the ship because they saw land. And they felt if they lighten the ship, they'll be able to get to land without hitting the rocks. So what's the message in that? Sometimes your ship goes down because you have cargo on it you don't have to have that they think you have to have. I think you should, I should slow that down. They threw over the wheat. They threw over the fishing tackles. They probably threw over their clothes, their gold, their money, everything that people think they have to have. Sometimes you'll find out when your ship about to go down, you didn't need that. In other words, I'm saying something we prioritize is not really what we need. A lot of people think they have to have big house, money, fame, clothes, cars. And a lot of people say, I can't live without it, River. Let a storm come. You let a storm come here to Atlanta bad enough, do you know what you'll do? You'll leave that stuff behind because all you're thinking about is your life. That means nothing when it comes to life. That car, you wouldn't be worried about it at all. If a flood came, all you're trying to do is get on a boat or get to a bus or a car and get away from that place. Sometimes God will let a storm come, and I don't want you to get this is powerful. Sometimes God will let your ship get in the middle of a storm to show you stuff you think you got to have. You won't be thinking about it when you're about to die. And there are times in life some stuff we don't need. We need to throw some stuff overboard so you can float lighter. 
What, what does that mean? Some of this stuff we got is too heavy. You're trying to carry people, take care of people. That's weighing you down. That you can't re-raise grown people. You can't raise a person when he's already grown. You need to just let it go. You, don't, you can't have all that money. You can't take it with you. And you think money is everything. When you get all this money, and I'm told everybody wins the lottery, always end up in tragedy. You can't take your good looks everywhere. You're going to get old. You can't take that car with you that you think you can't live without. And I need to throw this in that cell phone either. My God, some of you all come to church and sit up there and text and be on the internet while the man of God is preaching. What an insult it is to the church and to the gospel. Your mind is nowhere on God. Texting in service. Now, if you're going to have your Bible reading on your apps, fine. But you know you're out of the will of God. You didn't come for church. You're not even having church. Church not on your mind. And maybe God need to let you lose that job and cut it off. Because you're disrespecting the house of God to be on your phone, texting and carrying on. It's wonderful to have these phones. I love my iPhone because I can study my Bible on and preach my notes from it. It's great, but just some things, things are good for us can be disasters. Fire can warm our bodies, but it can also burn us up. Water can cleanse our body, but it can also drown you. You can misuse it. Some things, hey, money can be a great servant, but it can be a mean master. So listen, my friend, some stuff God will put you in a situation, you got to throw it overboard or you will die and sink with it. They had to get rid of it. Now, let's, I'm about to bring this to a close. Let's look what's, a, what's another great application in here. Once Paul spoke to them, Paul told them, look, you don't have to worry about anything. An angel came and spoke to me in the night and said all will live because they were talking about killing the, the uh, soldiers, were talking about killing the prisoners, which meant Paul. He talked about getting rid of them because if they had permitted them to go free or swim aboard, they would have been held liable. So, you know, if, you are, if you're a prisoner and you're the soldier, you're your captain who's over, over you, allow you to escape, Rome's going to take your life. So if you read the text, when they panicked and went in a storm and they got near land, they start worrying about what if some of the prisoners escaped and we could never get them, then we would be killed by Rome. But then Julius, the centurion who loved Paul, who was really in charge, he stopped him. He, he said, no, we're not going to do that. Now, why did he do that? He had already won, Paul had already won his heart. That man who was in charge saw God was with Paul because what Paul predicted came to be true. And he knew that Paul was a man of God. Now, I don't want you to miss this. God used Julius to keep them from killing the prisoners, which would have killed Paul. God used them to tell them, we won't do that. What am I saying today? Oh, listen, this is going to be good to you. They were saved because of Paul, who told them, the angel spoke to him and told them they will all live. And that stopped the persecution. God told Paul, a little further back in Acts 23, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to witness to Caesar. You're going to get there. Now, Paul didn't know exactly how we're going to get there. God didn't tell him, but you go in there. And when God got something for you to do, it may take some storms and some shipwrecks and all, but it's going to get you there. Paul ended up going wrong without paying his fare. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. He didn't have to pay no, no boat fare or nothing. He went as a prisoner for free. And God sometimes will let you end up somewhere for free because that's faith. And here's the good point. 
Have you ever thought about it? Sometimes God won't let lives be lost even though your ship bursts apart because of who you have on board. I found out that God is blessing a lot of people because a Christian is there in the house. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, the wife doesn't really have to leave the husband if she be pleased, that is pleased to stay with her, because her staying there has sanctified the home. Did you know that some of you all are blessed because you have a child of God in that house? That, that's favor. You have no idea. God not blessing that home because they just being blessed or uh, got, you know, uh, lucky. God may be holding off the wrath of God off that home because of that person in that house that God is shielding. And it could be a praying sister, a praying brother, a praying member of a church. That the only reason why that ship, people haven't lost much, is because of a Christian. I've seen that happen. I've seen some husbands who were mean and didn't love God and hated the church, but got jobs and were blessed because of a praying wife who goes to church. I've seen that happen many times. And you know what? The Bible supports that every time God got ready to bring his wrath on people, he got his people out the way. <laughs> when he got ready to destroy the world with water, he got Noah out the way. When he got ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he got Lot out the way. And when he gets ready to destroy this world, he's going to get the saints to be caught up in the rapture out the way. Then the wrath of God and the Antichrist and those creatures in Revelation 9 that got hair like a woman, teeth like a lion, so filthy that God won't let these kind of demons out on the world while the church is here. And one day the devil's going to get his key and he's going to unlock that cell and these demons going to come out on the earth. But the church will be gone. God is protect I believe the only reason why God has moved his wrath against the world today is because of the saints that are still here. And you have no idea when you're a child of God, favors are coming on others because you're there. And those men lie were saved because the Bible says Paul was on board and God didn't want him killed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What will you do? when your ship sinks and go down. You better listen to the man of God. You better not go with the crowd. You better not be in a hurry. And you better stay on the ship and don't jump. Paul told them, say, if you all jump this ship and try to go on, you know, some guys were trying to get on a little lifeboat, slip away. And so land said, we're gonna slip away and get away from here. Paul said, if you try, you will die, but stay on the ship. I want to tell you this, this, this afternoon, stop jumping ship. Maybe I ought to preach that one day. <laughs> Don't jump ships. Quit jumping from church to church. Quit jumping from people to people. Stay on board. Stand still. Wait and see what God's going to do. If they had jumped ship, they would have been drowned and killed because that those winds, those seas collided. That boat, that ship got stuck in sand bed, and you know what, got stuck and wouldn't move, and the tremendous waves came up against the boat and smashed the boat and broke it in pieces. But here's the good part. Paul said nobody would die, and they didn't. When they got off the ship, God enabled them to get off the ship, they got on a board and, you know, there were pieces left off the ship. They were able to grab a, a board and swim to shore. You know, the old preacher years ago preached about making it on broken pieces. Yes, they made it on shore because they were willing to go on broken pieces. When your ship burst apart and your ship goes down, 
You better hold on to your peace. Now your peace might be a janitor, but God will let enough floors get dirty to keep your job sweeping. Hmm. Your peace might be doing hair. Don't worry about the other person's peace. If that's your gift, God will let enough folk hair get, well, I won't say the word, tore up. <laughs> so you can keep doing hair. Say amen. Yes, if your piece is empty in the garbage can, God will let enough dirty folk, trash pile, keep coming so you'll keep a job. If your piece is singing, God will let enough people who want to hear you sing come through. Hold on to your piece. If your piece is preaching, God will let enough sinners come along and you hear the gospel for you to preach. I don't know what your peace is. Find your peace. But most important is stay with God and you'll make it on broken pieces. Now don't leave your peace trying to grab somebody else's peace. Hold on to your peace. Hold on to prayer. Hold on to grace. Hold on to salvation. And your peace will bring you in. Well, I'm done today. I just pray that these worries will lift you. You may be in a storm and your ship probably caught out there to sea and it's going down like the Titanic. But let me tell you, it's all right if it bursts apart and go down because it doesn't mean you going down. A lot of things have gone down. But can somebody wave your hand out there and say, I'm still here? Yes, I lost all that stuff I thought I had to have. I had to throw it overboard, by the way. But I found out I could do without some of these friends. I found out I could do without some things I thought I had to have. And I found out I can make it on broken pieces. Because what's most important, lose cars, lose houses, lose friends, but two things don't you lose. Don't lose your mind and don't lose your soul. Don't go crazy over nobody. Listen, look at me. Look at me. They are not worth it. Don't kill nobody because of what they do. Sitting in prison for the rest of your life, look at me. Repeat this. They are not worth it. You can make it on the pieces you got left. And you'd be surprised of yourself. A few years pass by, you will be proud of yourself. Well, I never thought I'd get over this, but I did. You know why? God got your back. Okay? God bless you, my friend. Now listen, friend. Share the word as always. Tell somebody about it. Let somebody know. Pastor got a word for you. You lost all. Your ship went down. You're going down. But it can go down, but not you. Don't you go down. You can always build another ship. And you can always get your cargo back. And if you don't get it all back, you still got your life. That's most important. Amen. Their lives were more important. So share this word. Tell people a lot of stuff you think you got to have, but don't, don't put nothing over your life. What good is it for a dead man to have a big house and a car? You better make sure you're living. As long as you're living, an old cabin will be nice enough if you know that life can be beautiful if you live it right each day. Share the word. Tell somebody whose ship who lost all is going down. Maybe next time, they'll pay attention, slow down, listen, and stay in church, okay? Share this message, my friend, and listen, every Sunday morning, I'll be preaching this Sunday. Come on over and bring some friends with you, and I'll be bringing the message in 9 o'clock. We start service at 9 o'clock a.m. sharp. We're out around 11.15, 11.30. 
So come over and worship. We have one service now. Mount Carmel is gone to one service. And we love it. We love it. My members love it. Like getting out of here. Don't come over here 11, 30, 12 o'clock. We'll be gone. That parking lot, when I leave 11, 30, 12, that parking lot is empty. <laughs> they are gone. <laughs> People don't like staying in church long now. And we have a great service. Our choir sing, our praise team. And then I get right on up and preach and we go. I teach and preach. My son and I rotate. I preach first and third Sundays at Camelton Road. And then I preach at Summer Hill, our other location, second and fourth Sundays at 8 o'clock. Summer Hill has gone to 8 o'clock and out at 9.30 at Summer Hill. That's 768 Martin Street, right downtown, just two blocks from the stadium downtown, Turner Field Stadium. You'll find our other location, Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Summer Hill, 768 Martin Street. Come and worship. There's a picture of it right there, 768 Martin Street. You know what? We start over there at 8 o'clock. We open the doors at 7 o'clock. We have Sunday school at 7.15 to 8, and all have nothing but praise, worship, and the word. At 9.30, we are gone. Just an hour and 30 minutes. If you work at night and you work night shift and you want to be out of church a little earlier, come on over to Summer Hill and you'll enjoy it over there. We love our church. It's just like being home. Amen. Join us at Summer Hill. A lot of people begin to wake up to that. They work night shift. All you nurses and, and doctors and other people that work night shift, you get off at 7. I used to work night shift 11 to 7, so I know that's graveyard shift. You need and want to go to church, come on, right? Dress just the way you are. If you work at night shift, I don't care how you dress. Come on to church. We're just going to be there about an hour and a half. Hear the word, 9.30, go home and go to bed. And then wake back up later on and you the others want to come at 9 o'clock to Cameron Road. Come on over here. We're out by 11.15, 11.30. Get out and go get this Sunday brunch. I love going to those. Now I can go to Sunday's brunch. And I, my wife and I love going to those because I don't want to eat no dinner at 12. We can go and Sunday brunch. You can go shopping. You can go to the mall and be with family and, and put those children in the bed on time to go to school the next morning. Amen. That's the way people like church now. Go on and live and have fun while you're here. Amen. And come worship with us on Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night we have 5 a.m. prayer meeting at 5 a.m. one hour. If you want prayer, come at 5 a.m. to 6. And that's powerful here every Wednesday. Come see me. We have lunch with God 11 to 2. You come and just pray at the altar. If you're going through something, come pray at the altar every Wednesday from 11 to 2. And come back that night at 7 o'clock, and I'll be teaching the Word of God. We're out about a quarter to nine. We start at 7 and out about a quarter to nine. So you can go home, take the kids home, go to bed. That's a little bit flow. Want more information about us, go to our website. That's Mount Carmel Baptist Church, mcbcatl.org. mcbcatl.org. Go there, you'll get direction on how to come to our church and visit with us here every Sunday. We just, we love having church over here as well as going to church. You will love my members of friendly people. We love everybody that walk through those doors. Amen. My friend, it's been a pleasure. And don't forget, if you're still looking for my old camp meeting song service, go to cdbaby.com. That's where you can find my product. And then you can go to my Amazon store, just type in my name, go to my Amazon store, you'll find all my sermons, a lot of you all keep calling about, we don't see your stuff in record stores like we used to because most record stores are going out of business, but I have an Amazon store, you'll find all my sermons, you'll find all my old camp meeting songs and all my music, or you can go to cdbaby.com and order online now, they also got my stuff on iTunes. I'm also on Pandora, if you like any of my music called Something New. Listen to me on Pandora Radio, just to name a few places where you can still find it. It's been a pleasure coming into your home. Hit like, let it go viral again. It's 10 or 12 of these messages going viral, and I'm happy to hear that they're hearing it all over the world. God bless you, and I love you, and see you next time.